Hello and welcome to the ranking of the Bloodborne bosses. As I'm sure most of you will know, I recently uploaded the final episode of the Bloodborne series, to which I will link in the bottom of the description for you to go and binge to your heart's content. So what this means is that Bloodborne is at its end, and I can finally fulfil a promise that I made all the way back in the Shadows of Yarnum video. Hey bitch, I think you should do like a uh, boss ranking once you finish your playthrough. You might actually upload it before Will. <laughs> Shut the fuck up! While I am sad to see Bloodborne leave, at least until I can be bothered to face the Chalice Dungeons in a Season 2, the Front Void won't be left open for too long, as Dark Souls 3 shall be taking its place in due course. Back to the list though, this is going to be judged upon my personal opinion, experiences and thoughts on each and every one of the 22 bosses that I covered in the 18 episodes. Once again, linked in the description, if you call me a sellout, I'll come to your house and I'll jump scare you. <laughs> as well as some other smaller details like cosmetic appearance and recognizability. What I mean by recognizability is that when I say Bloodborne boss, chances are you immediately thought of Ludwig or Orphan or whatever boss is at the top of your list. Much like if I said WWE wrestlers for example, you wouldn't think of Xavier Woods or Luke Harper immediately, you'd think of Triple H, John Cena, Braun Strowman. If you want an extra little challenge, take a shot whenever I say the word boss or fights. Please don't, that was a joke, you will die. Not all the footage is credited to me, so where I needed, I will credit the owner and leave their link in the description. But without further ado, let's get into this and rank all 22 bosses in Bloodborne. Starting off the list, you knew he was going to be here, you just fucking knew it. I mean, it was the first boss in which I faced, I got tricked into thinking the boss arena was a safe haven, and this big dog thing jumps over the wall and proceeds to clap my cheeks and wipe the floor with me over and over and over again. WHY WON'T YOU LOVE ME?! I can understand he's down at the bottom of the list because I have a piss poor experience with the guy, but it's justified because it's my list, my rules, and I literally just said that this was going to happen. This is going to be judged upon my personal opinion, Looks wise, he actually looks pretty cool, and I think the trailer that plays if you leave the main menu too long made a really good promotion for what most people are going to face. But you can't take the guy seriously when he looks like the mana caretaker from Scary Movie 2. From gameplay standpoint, and this being my first From experience and having my ass handed to me for a couple of days straight wasn't a good start, and it almost halted the series after a single episode. Now whether or not that's the entire point of a first boss in these types of games, I remember when I did the Dark Souls 3 PvP video I had a very similar of time fighting under Scundia, but I didn't really have a good couple of days with this guy. <laughs> yep, and there's a death. You fucking hate to see it. Granted, in New Game Plus, it'll probably have a very, very different result due to the amount of fought him and a later entry, but on the first playthrough, he was just an absolute bitch of him. The 21st spot on the list of course goes to the Bitches of Hemwick. If you're in the Grand Cathedral area, about to go to the Vicar Amelia boss fight, take a sharp left and go off the beaten path to find Hemwick Channel Lane, the where the party never stops and the occupants dance until their feet fall off. However, every good party has a Grinch to sully the fun, in this case two, as once you defeat the first witch, which you should be doing quite easily, even on a first playthrough. A second little hunched over Quasimodo bitch spawns, and the ability to resurrect the first one is also available here. Head and stab me! Which would be a problem if they both weren't as soft as a stick of butter. There's a tiny bit of added difficulty with BTEC blood starved beasts wandering the place. They can add a bit of a challenge due to the fact that when you kill your first witch, your fleeting moment of triumph is taken away by five or six of these spawning at once and a second health bar popping up. That is unless you have a low enough insight that they don't even spawn in the first place. I can fully understand why From made them an optional boss, but it's still a boss that you can happily go through an entire run and not be bothered that you miss them. Much like the Celestial- The Celestial Emissary is another boss that suffers from this same exact situation. As much as I like Roger the Alien Blue Goober's enemy- Here he is! <laughs> Roger the alien. What do you reckon of these enemies then? Roger the alien. <laughs> Newsflash, bong brain, I never pull out. Making one into a boss kind of seems like a way to pad out the game to me, and I don't even get me started on the Upper Cathedral War and the frankly insulting amount of brain linkers in that fucking foyer. Oh, 
Don't spam it, you little bitch. Like, why do you have to kill one to get the key? Just have it as an item on the floor like every other key in the fucking game. Taking the spot is the game's gank boss. You enter and see a swarm of these blue things sprinting towards you. As you kill them, you'll probably notice the health bar not going down, and that there's another set of blue goobies sat in the middle area. You hit one, and the health bar finally goes down, and from this point, the fight gets about as easy as taking candy from a premature baby. I'm, uh, I'm just gonna take this. Once he gets to about 50% health, he gets four times bigger, which would be a little bit more threatening if he didn't look like a giant water balloon. Hello! And once he gets to 25% health, he gains projectile attacks. Although if you're good enough at leading the small goobers away and come into the fight with a decent build and maybe some fire or bolt paper, then chances are he won't get to use any of them. This guy is actually meant to be a perfected version of the living failures in the lore, which granted I did find interesting in my research of the health phases, but he doesn't get to hold that much of a status if people with decent builds are killing him in under two minutes. You'd have a harder time going up to the top of a castle and taking that candy from the premature baby. Murgo's Wet Nurse is next on the list, and is actually one of the three optional bosses to end the game. Once you manage to climb to the top of Murgo's loft, you enter the boss arena and prepare to pull a full cat cue in. I really don't care that you're a baby. I'll snap your neck like a twig. But then a faceless raven monster appears and prepares to protect Queen Yarnum's child. A brilliant concept in theory, Queen Yarnum, the Thumerian Queen, a great one, would obviously have Nanny McPhee with an obsession for blades guarding her child. But this isn't in theory. Murgo's wet nurse design-wise, Hidetaka Miyazaki, I tip my 2012 fedora to you, sir, because the look of this thing is just fucking amazing. However, the actual fight for me was just a little bit underwhelming to go against, since once she dies, the hunter's dream literally goes ablaze. Get the water, nigga! Jesus Christ! Lord have mercy! Because she is literally classed as a final boss. It only has three, possibly four attacks it uses reliably, most with a big wind-up so you know exactly where the attack is coming from and where to dodge through. She has the six blade twirl and swipe, the six blade frontal swing, and what I can only describe as the world's most deadly car wash. The one time in the fight I was actually a bit scared I was going to die was when the fog came in, but then once I realised you can just run around and wait it out, the fight went right back to the way it used to be, beating the shit out of a nurse. This is the first boss that I generally had really mixed feelings about, again the design I think is brilliant, round of applause to From, but considering that she can potentially cause the end credits to roll, it's just really underwhelming that I beat her on the first time. It was almost like a chore to do so that I could get to German, kind of like cleaning the house for spiders. Rom the Vacuous Spider, or Rom the Incompetent Landmass as some people know him as, is an, an interesting boss. If boss even is the word, he kinda just sits there while sending his nosediving weak as Ben Askren in a boxing ring spider lackeys to attack you, and hope you don't slap some scars on his slug of a body because his rock face is practically in- the only attacks that prove a threat are the AoEs and the projectile ones, the big bomb where he sits on his ass and performs a big AoE attack, the rising rocks where he just summons rocks to rise upwards around him, and the B-Tech Call Beyond, which is about as threatening to anyone that doesn't know how to use the Joestar secret technique. Each and every one of them are easy to avoid though if you're quick enough at identifying that it's going to happen, and his melee attacks, essentially the head swipe the balls do, and then he throws a tantrum, are also very avoidable as long as you're not greedy for damage. The saving grace that keeps him high enough to not be called a joke for me is the arena. The vast lake light expansives that really contradict the previously used colour palettes, the dark and dismal black and grey of the Forbidden Woods and Bergenworth, to the white and bright arena that you fight him in. What I also think is cool is the fact that in law wise he controls the barrier that prevents normal humans from seeing the true horrors around them, which is why after you beat him you can then see the amygdalas vibing around Yara Ghul and Central Yarnum. It's attention to detail that puts Rom a little bit higher than the bottom tier of bosses on the list, but still the fight itself just seems like a big game of cat and mouse. Speaking of cat and mouse, boy oh boy where shall I start with this bitch? He's a hunter fine, so surely he should be up higher on the list based on the fact that my personal playstyle clutches to parries and visuals as much as Homelander clutches onto relevancy. You see that? That is a reference that is outside of games I play and topical for current times. I too am wow. diversifying my content. If I wanted to run about in a video game for 10 minutes of my life, I'd have played some Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games. I've come to make an 
announcement, Shadow the Hedgehog pissed on my fucking wife! I mean, the fight isn't fun if there's hardly even any fighting. The fight is split into two separate sections. The first, chase an old man until he stops and then beat him up. And the second, chase an old man until he stops and beat him up except the old man has a chance to fight back. If you manage to chase Mikkel Ash into the first room without being stopped by those bastard skeletons, Fucking skeletons, man! Yeah, I pulled a sneaky on you. Then good news, you've got one of the most intense boss fights to look forward to. Backing him up into a corner, stunlocking him, and beating him up until he runs away. Then you go upstairs, inevitably get shot by this little shit here, and then chase Miglash again. This time, though, it's even more of a bitch, because he takes you either to the higher level of the building, or the lower level, and then jumps through the mirror like Mario through a fucking painting. <laughs> And has you meet him back in the middle to repeat the process over and over again as he changes the route and prays for dear life that you don't throw an excessive amount of poison eyes into his very thick skull. And let's not forget the skeletons are still here to make your day a living hell. Stop! You I swear to God, alright, I'm gonna kill you now. What am I last note? The expanded moveset does provide a bit more risk, for example a Call Beyond, or as I call it, aimbot for arcane builds, taking you down to a slither of health if you're hit by a single bolt. He does get more aggressive, and the fight does take a sudden ramp up in speed, but considering he's a very late game boss in the story, Mikolas is just kind of a... Just kind of a living fate. Next up are the Vibe Masters, the fucked up versions of the Celestial Emissary and the first Old Hunters DLC boss on the list. They're slightly better than the Emissary, it takes a bit more of a punch for them to go down, however the difference is that they're parryable, so at least for me, that made it a lot easier. The fight itself is fun if you don't cheese it, however it's just repetitive, five or six of these big blue fuckers just wandering about, with the same attack pattern, same parry windows, if you kill one another just pops out of the ground, I mean the whole fight just makes me want to... But again, similarly to ROM, I do love the arena that you fight them in. The whole garden, flowery aesthetic, cauliflowery, if you want my crap pump to go up. The best thing about the arena is the big sunflower in the middle, partially because it makes up the space in the arena in which you can then call it big enough to call a boss arena, but just small enough to not make the fight an absolute cakewalk. And essentially, it makes brilliant cover for the big vibe attack, as people have deemed it. Oh, I think I see the vibe where they raise their long blue arms into the air and throw a seemingly endless amount of deadly space rocks whose only weakness seemed to be arguably oversized foliage. My time through this fight, I genuinely really enjoyed it, but I think that was mostly up to the design of the boss and the fact that they just mashed their heads into the ground and not the actual fight. I found it more of a tedium boss, like I don't see it as a chance to refine my abilities. Their attacks have decently big wind-ups, so you can easily dodge out of harm's way before it even comes your way, and their parry window are as open as an Ibiza stripper's put. Also considering the fact that Lady Maria is immediately after him, again it just seems like a very half assed way to pad out game time for this part of the game. The, the next boss is dark. Dark Beast Pal, my opinion of this guy is rocky, mostly because I'm part of the group that didn't have enough firepower in my weapon to stagger reliably. I found him purely by accident, it was actually the only boss in the series in which I found with absolutely no assistance apart from being told very subtly there was a boss in the Hypergen Jail. It was certainly a surprise when I found him, you exit the jail after fighting a wolf that quite literally has a foot up his ass. This boy got a foot in his ass! This boy's got a foot in his ass. And enter a big open field. You waltz right into the arena and a massive pile of rocks just wakes up, gains the power of Zeus, and hops about like a rabbit on ketamine and rips you apart if you don't have the weapon that can reach high enough to do it just about tickle his gooch. What I mean by reliably stagger him is if you manage to get enough hits on him, he falls over and loses the electric buildup. And if you continuously hit the leg that he's trying to cut stand up with, you can keep him down on the ground, I'm pretty sure indefinitely. For me though, on the off chance I got him down, he just built up the electricity again and shot me into next week. I believe the fight is a match made in heaven for weapons like the boom hammer or the burial blade, but me clutching onto the saw cleaver for dear life found it a little bit more difficult. With a few more fights and playthroughs, I feel like I could grow to like Pal a bit more, but for now he's sat pretty low on the list, and I'm pretty sure his Chalice Dungeon Loran counterpart will inevitably fist my fucking <laughs> dick me down <laughs> carrot. But this is the base game version we're on about, and I did like the fact that when you beat him and open the door, it leads you right back into old yarn and where you previously fought the Bloodstone. The 
third boss that I faced during the series was good old skin flaps over here. The build up to his boss in my opinion is the highlight. You enter this big area known as Old Yarnum in which Jura, the last powder keg hunter, believes the inhabitants are of no threat and if you insist on ripping them apart like you believe you should, he picks up Sasha and promptly spends $400,000. He may have outsmarted me a couple of times, but I've yet to meet one that can outsmart bullet. But once you progress enough and kill enemies with fabulous placement I must add, you come across the chapel in which Flaps McGee can be found, a large dirt path leading up to it and fire pretty much everywhere. But this is kind of where the excitement ends. The boss is a decently fun fight, he poisons you pretty much every hit that he hits you with. But the second and third phase are pretty much just the first phase but with a bigger target. He does three main attacks that continue to be used throughout all three phases and are all parryable and that's exactly how I managed to get through him the first time. When the only reliable way I can fight a boss without luring him into a corner and spamming him with fire paper is to wait until he does the same attack over and over again and keep punishing for it, then he gets a bit repetitive. If Rom added a system where if a boss gets punished for doing an attack too much, then the attack is used less or less, or even removed from the moveset entirely. That would be a really good implement for the Bloodstar Beast, but without it, the only thing that's not got the Bloodstar Beast lower on the list is quite honestly Old Yarnum, my third favourite level per se, behind Kanehurst and the Hunter's Dream, or more specifically where you fight the Moon Pre The super duper secret final boss of Bloodborne, the Moon Presence certainly provides the best ending in my opinion, as after you scram those delicious umbilical cords, the Moon Presence can't consume you like he wants to, therefore attacks you and you kill it, becoming an infant great one as a result. I like this ending better than you replacing German if you kill him without eating the cords or just letting German game end you. It's mostly to do with this fight, after having a beautiful yet tragic fight with the first hunter, you are greeted to fight what I can only describe as a god. The wiki describes them as powerful beings that can exist on multiple planes of existence, but god just sounds more professional. While I did have an easy-ish time fighting it, especially since he's a final boss, it took me about three attempts. It perfectly encapsulates the story progression from start to finish. If you go through and fight only the story bosses, then you go from fighting a stinky breath hunter with PTSD from a music box, to a spider who can control things that you see, to a literal god. Granted, the fight is a lot less chaotic when you understand the attack patterns, if you understand the blood shower stops from healing, if you understand that when he drops you to 1 HP, the orange bar stays around for a lot longer than normal, you can pretty much heal to full when he's staggered, so at some points the fight can be a little bit easy, at least for a secret final boss. But still, I enjoy the fight because of his appearance and the fact that it ends the game in a way which I believe is the good ending. Or at least the best ending, being reincarnated as a baby great one. Or I guess you could say, a one re- The One Reborn is a fantastically grotesque boss and tops off the bottom half of this list because of it. The midpoint of this list is sketchy because I am normally a quite a positive person and unless I absolutely despise something with a passion, I will have something good to say about it. So from this point in the list, the negativity towards the bosses dies down and focuses on more why the bosses are on the top half of the list. But first, we have to talk about this beautiful monstrosity. The boss I really like, he isn't a pile of aborted fetuses like I was led to believe. <laughs> but instead is the final failed experiment of Lawrence in trying to use blood healing to transcend humanity to the status of Great Ones. While on my way to fight Parv, I, uh, I actually almost ran into this arena instead and almost messed up the whole progression I was supposed to take, but fighting him was a fun experience. The second half at least, more on that in a bit. The best part of this boss is the exploration you have to make in regard to his body, where to hit, what takes the most damage, and what deals the most damage. What I did, and I think people do more often than most, is to stick to the middle section and then when he's staggered go for a head, and since he's got plenty of those there's not much need to worry. The thing that makes this fight worse than others though is the first half. You don't fight the boss, he fights you. The first half, if you don't want the fight to be a hellhole, then you've got to go up to the upper level and kill the six bell bitches that spawn at the top and stop him from healing and stop fireballs coming your way. This is what kills the fight for me. A fight is only good if it's good throughout. You can't have a fight be shit for the first half and then make up for it by having a big climax. Like imagine you're fighting Deckers with the lag effect for the first first half of the fight and then the second half it ramps it up and you fight Snake Eater Boss and Wind Waker Gamble all in one and the climax is amazing but it's only a mid-range fight because of the shit intro. While I like the One Reborn, this first part just slides in down slightly on the list. It's purely because the One Reborn kind of just sits in the bell bitch's shadow of your- 
Shadows of Yharnam. This was the first fight that there was some kind of alteration to a boss fight. Prior to this, there was one-on-one -on -one fight that was just hit boss and avoid being hit yourself. When you brave the Forbidden Woods, run past all the snakes, say hi to Lord Buckethead, and then trial and fail to beat the abhorrent beast. I'm gonna have to fight him in the Chalice Dungeons, aren't I? Come across the Shadows of Yharnam. Three cloaked individuals that all have their different movesets. You've got the one that spits out fireballs, and have a trot and has a top, a ton to nitrous, the flame sprayer that has a katana and spits fire at you, and the swordsman who channels his inner Gyobu Masasaka Onuwa and aggressively goes after you with a two-handed sword. This fight is kind of the opposite to the Bloodstar Beast fight, I enjoyed it because it was fresh and fun and the trump card where they summon a massive snake is really fun because it adds an extra level of awareness, but the area prior is a bit like Buster. The Forbidden Woods is the longest level in the game and the two shortcuts that you can use to get to the boss fight are very far apart and it takes a lot of effort to get through. But if you can get through all that, the boss is really enjoyable because it teaches you the art of crowd control. Not a lot of fights had taught me much by the time I got to them. Gascoigne and Bloodstar Beast taught me to parry and the Cleric Beast taught me resilience in a fight. But crowd control was yet to be covered and the shadows emulate this perfectly. Depending on the route you take, you can either tackle the ranged and have the two melee coming after you. Or if you go for a melee, then you just need to find some cover from the ranged one and go ham on the one that you're targeting. I like to think these guys were previously scholars of Bergenworth under Willem that got infected by snakes, as they're kind of a crowd control tutorial for Ron with the little spiders. And once you beat her, you feel happy you met the shadows first to teach you that, as the Blood Moon ritual has started. And everywhere you see, you can see Am- Amygdala, or Amygdala, however you choose to pronounce it, is next, but if you do call it Amygdala, you're wrong. Have mercy on the poor bastards that don't take you seriously, because this boss can certainly pack a punch. I know that I beat it on my first attempt, but I feel like chronologically you're meant to fight him after Rom, as once you get whisked away by one of the inbred fingers. She's got six fingers! Inbred! It takes you indirectly to the Nightmare Frontier, where the boss can be found, so I think I was pretty overleveled for it. However, looking at other boss rankings to see how I should format this video, I saw people being clowned on by the Amygdala, and wondered how the fight would have been if I had gone into it at the correct level. I really, really like the design of the Amygdala, probably my second favourite design boss in the game. It's rather basic at the start, he just flails his arms around a bit and then leaves his very big, obvious weak point on the ground for you to slap about however you want. After he gets back up, he'll throw in another tantrum and leave his very sensitive head on the ground again and when he gets up he'll do pretty much the exact same thing. Did I mention his head is the weak point? Second phase tests the timing of your attacks based on what little you already know about his attack patterns as the normal attacks he does leave an AOE a few seconds after he hits. This keeps you on your toes as the windows in which you get to attack are smaller and smaller the longer the fight goes on. Apart from that nothing else nothing else really happens in the fight I mean he just keeps attacking you leaving his head on the floor for you to just hit and then he gets up does it again and then that's did he just rip off his arms to use as a weapon holy fucking shit Yes, once you get him down to a certain health pool, he 127 hours himself and rips off his arms and slaps you silly with them. A really fucking core cool concept to me, like this guy's been vibing in the Nightmare Frontier, worshipped by thousands, had statues of him made and put up on display in the Grand Cathedral, and a hunter comes along and tries to dethrone him, but well, it doesn't go his way and he just fucking rages out. He rips his arms off in one desperate attempt to stop you from killing him. When you do manage to kill him, Patches the Spider will call it a piteous bastard in which you bestowed salvation, which to me seems like a very nice and fitting end to this beautiful great one. Father Gascoigne is the first boss you have to fight to progress the story, and is fitting as such due to the fact that he forces players to adapt to a playstyle. If you go into the fight and swing randomly and hope you get hits in, then you're going to die. If you stay back and wait for a good window, chances are they will catch up with you and you're going to die. If your parrying skills are not what they should be, or that you can't find his parry windows, then you are going to die. As some of you know, Hunter fights are my favourite out of the variety available in Bloodborne, and this fight is partially the reason why I like them so much. The cutscene that introduced Introduces him, shows him carving up the beast with an axe, and immediately shows himself to be a threat, which in the fight is indeed the case. Something I thought of while researching the lore for this script is that when you first fight him, he says, Beasts all over the shop, you'll be one of them sooner or later. And I thought about what he meant by beasts. Obviously, there's the Yarnamites that we see in Central Yarnam, but we go through the game and kill things sometimes without any previous aggravation, possibly foreshadowing to the player about your deeds. 
Or maybe he was referring to when you reject German's offer to reawaken, essentially turning your back on the hunters. It will be interesting to see what you guys think, so let me know in the comments below. The fight for me is very fun. There are the perfect amount of changes for such an early fight that it isn't a major threat, yet it keeps it fresh enough to give the players a few surprises. For example, this thing. Yeah, maybe instead of talking to us in that intro sequence, he was actually talking about himself. Tiny music box can be used to make this fight a little bit easier, but obviously I had no clue it even existed at that point. But regardless, the fight was really, really good, and I liked it a lot because it prepared me for the rest of the Hunter fights in this run. Like German, Old Hunters in the Nightmare, even the likes of Lady Marie. Next on the list is the boss that immediately follows after the living failures, and my god is an improvement on that fight. A corpse should be left well enough alone. Tell that to the astral clock tower cleaner who has to sweep your dead body off the floor of this clock tower over and over and over again. Like, Lady Maria will give you a run for your money with her fire blood and Rakuyo. Lady Maria is a breath of fresh air for people that prefer hunter fights, due to the previous bosses being Ludwig and living failures, and being constantly harassed by cauliflowers in the previous area. Phase 1 is a normal hunter fight, she has decently readable attacks, enough to know they're coming but still quick enough that your dodging has to be refined to get through them. Second phase ups the ante and pressures you on your dodge timing even more with follow up blood attacks on the Rakuyo, and third phase punishes bad timing even more as some of the charge up attacks you now have to dodge around instead of the usual towards as the fire will hit you if you dodge towards. Long story short, if you aren't able to dodge, you will be by the end of this fight. Fun lore lesson, Lady Maria, a descendant of Kanehurst Queen Annalise, favoured the Rakuyo as a hunter weapon, and she was the reason why the Rakuyo is in the well after beating the ship whales. Oh, good god, golly almighty! And it's because after she harvested the blood from Koz, it took its toll on her mentally, so she threw it in the well. Yeah and ended up in the Hunter's Nightmare. What interested me is even though she's in the Hunter's Nightmare, she still studied to be one of the first Hunters to join the Nightly Hunt, and studied under none other than G German, the first Hunter. Tonight, he joins the hunt. And what a hunt he performs! The final Hunter fight for you to go up against, the second potential final boss, definitely lives up to the final boss status more than the other two. There's not much about this boss that I don't like, the build up is brilliant. After beating Murgo's wet nurse, you go back to the hunter's dream and see that it's caught on fire. Then you go to the doll, that tells you that German is waiting for you at the base of the tree. When you find him, you can either choose to let him kill you and awaken in a new day after the hunt, or you can choose to fight him. Either option, the result is a cinematic masterpiece. The peacefulness and tranquility of the flower garden provides again a very drastic change of the previous colour palette and ambience of the game going around from the darkness of central Yarnum and Yahagul to the brightness of the white flowers and the light grey sky with the pillars. The fight continues to impress as German stands up, wields a scythe at you. This is a hunter fight to end all hunter fights. He'll use the scythe to hook you in and eviscerate you, he'll jump in the air in an AOE on the ground, he'll continue to shoot you until he decides to stop. I'm not sure as to whether it's because I fought him more recently than most others that he's high on the list, but you cannot deny that this fight is a very good fight to finish off the game. But the main reason why this fight is my favourite hunter fight of all time is because of the music. The orchestral masterpiece that Fromm put behind this fight is wonderfully tragic and solidifies the fact that this is one of the final fights that you will have in the game. If you choose to not eat the umbilical cords before you go into this fight, then the theme just tells you that this is the end of the game and it is the perfect way to finish off ending 2. It's kind of cliche that he's final boss material, the mentor that's been helping you from start to finish, but it fits in really well with Bloodborne, where hunters fight you around seemingly every corner and matches brilliantly with his dialogue. Dear, oh dear, what was it? The hunt? The blood? Or the horrible dream? Oh, it doesn't matter. It always comes down to the hunter's helper to clean up after these sorts of messes. Tonight, Gammon joins the hunt. Catharsis. 
the process of releasing and thereby providing relief from strong or repressed emotions. The mana caretaker has returned and this time he's back from hell with a vengeance quite literally because he's on he's on fire this time but my god what a fight this fight jerked two dicks for me first a brilliant optional boss for the old hunters dlc and going into the lore of how lawrence left bergenworth to found the blood healing church only to fall victim to the infected blood he tried so hard to perfect and turn into the first cleric beast left to burn for eternity due to the curse sat on him by cars for the slaughter of the fishing hamlet secondly i wanted to kill this bitch with the wrath of a thousand sons for what the first cleric beast did to my goddamn innocence. But joking aside, this was the perfect test to teach me how my skills in the game had actually grown. The first episode I got slapped around by this monster and he almost forced me to have Bloodborne be a standalone video. To now entering the Hunter's Nightmare and bringing an end to the man that brought about the beasts and the hunt in the first place. I will admit, I did have a small amount of Gascoigne PTSD when I heard that accursed scream. You know what I mean, like... I've not missed that scream in the slightest. <laughs> but I did enjoy the fight all the same. I beat Lawrence on the same day, I beat Celestial Emissary, Abritus, Amygdala, and all the others that took me to the finish. So it did take me a lot shorter of a time to beat Lawrence than the Cleric Beast, which I do think shows how far I've come in the game. But we're yet to get to my favourite part of the fight, and we all know what it is. When he reaches 40% health, he pulls a full Johnny Joe star, nettles from the Predator, motherfucking Lawrence Gordon. He loses his lower body, is what I'm saying. People have said that this second phase is really difficult, but to be completely honest, I just found that sticking to his strong hand... Oh, take my hand! No, give me your other hand! No, oh, my other hand is strong enough is the best way to beat him but i really do love lawrence as a boss mostly to do with the fact that it shows concretely that i've improved but also because he's really fun and is a great way to re-implement the arena of vicar Amin Kicking off the top 5, we have my personal first wall of the game. Vic Romelia is probably my favourite fight of the game's storyline bosses. Upon reaching her in the Grand Cathedral, you see Amelia, the successor to Lawrence, and approach her, only for her to turn into a grotesque dog, deer, mummy monster thing. No! Now I fought this boss at the biggest disadvantage possible, or in other words, fought her without the use of the numbing mist, which can be found a short walk away from the boss, but I'd say the boss is almost a little bit more fun having to juggle with the extra item slot being used. With this being my first wall, I spent a decent amount of time with her, and I do really enjoy the fight, although I don't know how to actually repost her by breaking her limbs, so I was just brute forcing her. Vicar Amelia actually made me adapt to a different playstyle than I was used to, which is another reason why she's up on the list, because she made me a better hunter. Before this fight, I fought the Cleric Beast, who I brute forced with Molotovs, Gascoigne, who died to a flurry of repost and a couple of cocktails, and the Bloodstyled Beast, who I beat with parries alone. So Vicar and her unable to be Harriness forced me to adapt to a different, more dodge-centered attack style, which definitely benefited me in the long run, as bosses like Murgo's Wet Nurse, Marta Legarius, and this fucker will absolutely abuse you if your dodging is anything under experience. So I do have to thank Vicar for improving my dodging and adaptability in a fight. One small thing, why do the speedrunners call her Thicker? Like, surely that's bestiality. She's literally, she's literally a dog. I mean, all fours, hairy, Fucking come on guys. Longing for some type of human contact, I climbed through a window into the room. Upon my entering, the people inside became terrified. They screamed and collectively fled from the room, many stumbling blindly with their hands held over their eyes towards the walls in search of an exit. As I moved towards one of the room's alcoves, I detected a presence and approached it slowly. I cannot even hint what it was like, for it was a compound of all that is unclean, uncanny, unwelcome, abnormal, and detestable. It was the ghoulish shade of decay, antiquity, and dissolution. The putrid dripping eidolon of unwholesome revelation. The awful barring of that which the merciful earth should always hide. God knows it was not of this world, or no longer of this world. And in its mouldy, disintegrating apparel, an unspeakable quality that chilled me even more. Abritus, Daughter of the Cosmos, is my favorite designed boss, hands down. The only great one to commune with the corporate with humans, her design is worked beautifully and pays homage to H.P. Lovecraft's Cthulhu perfectly, even to the smallest details of entering through the window to find her and the members of the healing church like Gascoigne, Vicar Amelia and the real boss of Bergenworth. Alfred! No, that's not Alfred. That's not Alfred! 
That is not Alfred! All having headdresses that cover their eyes to simulate the fleeing party guests running away with their hands over their eyes. Her fight, while slightly underwhelming in the first phase, still managed to find ways of tripping me up and keeping me on my toes. And when second phase arrived and she's now able to cause frenzy to stack and summons the cosmos to send space lasers at you, it's a beautiful fight that I love. Well, it might not seem that way in the video. Fucking get in there, fucking bitch, man. People seem to think that it's the hardest optional boss in the base game, maybe even the hardest boss in base game, period. But I didn't think so, not to the extent that people think she is. It might be a similar amygdala situation that I went to a much more overleveled than I should have been. While she was hard, I wouldn't say she's the hardest, and what I love most about her is she shows perfectly what a great one is, both during the fight and the amount of details that the lore tabs have on the game. In third place, we have the King of Canehurst, my second wall of the game. The fight with Marta is delightfully paced. The first phase is relatively slow, with Marta only really going for melee attacks if you get close enough to him, and focuses mainly on attacking you with arcane attacks. His scythe is able to summon skulls and homing attacks to hit you, and once you enter his second phase, however, he goes back to his healing church executioner roots, choosing instead to chase you and hit you with his scythe and dagger, and lays back on the arcane attacks, with the exception of the sword. Nobody likes the sword. The best part about Ligarius is that when you died, you know why. Whether that be a poorly timed dodge or a secondary attack you didn't see coming, or maybe you fell off the edge of the roof like a complete idiot. But the crown of this fight, if you pardon, pardon the pardon, pardon, is again the lead up. Kanehurst is without question my favourite area in the game. A dilapidated castle once home to the Vilebloods, now relegated to instead Hal's blood lickers and stolen Dark Souls 1 assets. <laughs> What are you? When you go to Aya Sepica's clinic, pick up the summons and then head to Hermwick Channel Lane to see the coach arrive, you're greeted with a beautiful cinematic of the castle's exterior. You explore the vast and what you think are empty hallways and reach the roof where Ligarius sits, guarding the vile secret that he discovered about the vile bloods. Beat him, you take his crown, as well as being given access to one of the best blood tinged weapons if you pledge allegiance to the vile bloods. The Shikage. I got the Shikage, used it twice, and called it Yo. You know, because. because then it's a. It, it's a yo, yo And before you comment that there's another Kira meme, yes, I do realize I'm a child. Or, I guess you could say, orphan. Orphan of Kos, Infant of the Great One Kos, takes number two on my list and is very well deserved. The Orphan acts as the final boss of the Old Hunters DLC and behaves very accordingly. He packs a punch, even if it is with a placenta, but most people refer to him as the hardest boss in Bloodborne and is the most aggressive in Soulsborne. But the community voted as the hardest boss in Bloodborne. Orphan of Kos is without a doubt one of the most aggressive if not the most aggressive boss in the entire Soulsborne series. The first phase acts as the groundwork for what the fight will be. He jumps about periodically, some of his attacks parryable and others can be punished with a backstab, but if your dodging and parrying is at a good enough level, then the first phase can be done without too much trouble. So why is he final boss material? Because when second phase starts, he grows twice his size, gains wings for some reason or another, and starts hopping about, swiping you with his placenta like he just inhaled a whole brick of coke at once. This flips the fight on its head. Parries are essentially dead weight at this point, if you go for them, you're going to get hit and miss it. And backstabs only come around if you're 100% confident that you can dodge everything coming at you from a 5 mile radius. The fact that you can go a decent length onto the shore can hinder the fight a little bit. I did it because every time I got to a second phase on the beach, I always ran out of room far too quickly. But if you manage to best this magnificent man, then you have one last step to do to release the poor, wise and child of its state in the nightmare. As its spirit will hang around its mother's corpse until slain. Doing so pleases Cos as she releases the curse placed on the old hunters and ending the nightmare for good. As a non Soulsborne vet, it was fascinating going through the separate boss's lore entries to find about the story and better understand why I did the things I did. For example, I thought I'd killed the orphan because follow the beaten path until block, then kill the block and keep following the beaten path. But learning that killing him returned his spirit to the cosmos and freed the blood drunk slash old hunters from their sins of what they did to the fishing hamlet was all too mesmerizing. And it's because of this reasoning that I think Orphan is a perfect final boss of the DLC and takes number two, second to only one.
And of course, the man who takes the top spot may be seen as controversial due to the number of times he absolutely fisted the shit out of me. And yes, while I did die to Ludwig the most out of any Bloodborne boss, he was actually the one who I believe helped me the most. After being dismissed as a beast-possessed degenerate by detractors of Ludwig and his core of healing church hunters, he transformed into the beautiful boy we all know and love, killing beasts blindly and creating the large blood-soaked underground corpse pile that we fight him in. Ludwig was by far the biggest learning curve for me in the game, and facing him so early before Orphan, Namigdor, even Abritus and the like, changed me and my playstyle the most out of any other boss had in the past. It is because of Ludwig that my dodging went from passable to in some cases exceptional. It is because of Ludwig that I learned perseverance in a fight after putting two massive holes in my desk and almost breaking my hand. If you weren't good at the game, Ludwig was going to make you good or make you quit. If you died to an attack, he would keep throwing it at you until you knew how to avoid it. If you showed even the slightest little bit of weakness in your armour, he was going to exploit it whether you liked it or not until it was gone. If you were to ask me what my one regret in my first playthrough through Bloodborne was and the videos that I made on it, it would be the amount of grief that I gave Ludwig. I called him unbalanced, I called him broken, I called him unfair. And frankly, looking back on the video, I find that very hard to believe. That's just me going through a playthrough on the first time. That's me being bad and blaming it on the game like I tend to do in so many other occasions that you've seen. And honestly, I've been tempted to make a second playthrough purely just to fight Ludwig again. I feel like it took me 153 attempts to beat him the first time. Yes, I counted. But I feel like if I went and fought him again, it would take me less than 20 because he refined my playstyle and refined my dodging and all of that to a point in which I could almost flawless the entire fight. I could flawless the first phase and I'd take one or two hits in the second. And it's these facts that make me love Ludwig any more than any boss. Not to mention the Holy Moonlit Sword you get after defeating him is basically a cheat code for anyone with a decent arcane build and the main area of the Hunter's Nightmare perfectly encapsulating what I thought Bloodborne was going to be. A large maze-like area with enemies around every turn and bosses that beat the shit out of you for looking at them funny. During the period between Legarius and Mikalash, I had heard Vinks and others talk about god-tier bosses and that Ludwig was the first I was going to face, and my god did he deliver on that promise, both fight-wise, arena-wise, and design-wise. And because of it, it all adds up to him taking top spot on the list of my favourite Bloodborne bosses. And I agree. Thank you so much for sitting by and watching both this and the Bloodborne episodes I've poured so much of my time, heart and effort into. Again, if you want to watch them, there will be a link in the top of the description. Dark Souls 3 is going to be the next Soulsborne game on the list, so that will be coming out in due time. But before then, I thank you and bid you farewell, good hunters. I hope you find your worth in the waking world.